constantly casting herself a victim. It's as if they believe, it's as if she was looking for a way out from the very beginning. Hello, I'm Matt Wilkinson. I'm the Royal Editor of The Sun, and welcome to the latest in the series of The Sun's new royal show, Royal Exclusive. Uh, with me today is author and journalist and my old friend, it's Valentine Lowe. Hello, Matt. Thanks Hello, for coming Matt. on. Thanks for coming. Um, should we dive straight in? Absolutely. So, your former uh, newspaper, The Times, has this week uh, reported that Harry has suggested that he, he could or would like to maybe come back and fulfil some kind of royal role. Now, four years ago, this was obviously completely ruled out. Do you think it is a possibility that Prince Harry could come back and pick up some kind of part-time or hybrid role while the King is unwell? Or is this, you know, complete pie-in-the-sky thinking? Well, when I first read that story, I thought it was absolutely fascinating. I thought, because this, this would change everything, because it's, up to now it's been completely ruled out. And what was interesting was that, you know, within about 24 hours, sources from the palace were ruling it out. I mean, it has to be said, it's pretty unlikely, um, because the, the late Queen, Elizabeth II, was very clear that Harry and Meghan could not have a hybrid role, could not be half in, half out, as, as they wanted to do. Uh, and Prince Charles, as he then was, King Charles now, was absolutely behind that. It's not as if the royal family was divided in their view. So I think Charles is quite clear that they can't have a hybrid role. So the suggestion, wherever it came from, it obviously came from somewhere, mm. uh, the, the suggestion seems to be off the mark, I think. It, it seems to have been a sentiment that Harry might have, but as you say, both sides in, in London and California have said this is, you know, a long way off. There aren't any kind of formal moves or formal yeah. talks, but he... It, it kind of goes against, you know, some of the ideas that, that, that Harry has come out with in, in recent years, but if he was to pursue this, because obviously the, the King is unwell, if he was to say, I'm here to help, what kind of obstacles... In, in reality, if he was to actually say, I want to do this now. What kind of obstacles do you think are in his way? We've also got... You mentioned the king. Well, there's also... also first of all, is there's the general principle of, you know, uh, does their... Do their commercial activities in the United States, does that any way impinge on royal activities? Because, obviously, if you're here as a full-time working role in this country, you know, you're not undertaking commercial activities, so nothing is going to taint... The, the monarchy, and that was always the late Queen's fear that what they did up did commercially, which could be perfectly valid, uh, would, would would taint the brand uh, uh, and the mystique, as it were, of the monarchy. So that's one brand. The other is personal. I mean, Harry and Meghan have said so many things about William, about Camilla, about his own father. Uh, um, that you, you would have thought that there, there, there's, there's huge barriers to him coming over and doing anything. In the long run. Can I completely rule it out? No, I don't think I can. You know, there could be a world, but it's so far off. It's, it's, I don't think you can consider it for the moment. Would the king accept it, maybe, though? He's always said that his door is op always open, um, that if Harry comes over, he would, you know, he's always welcome to come round for dinner. I mean, he's, he, he could be unwell for a long amount of time. I mean, could, could the king, in a, in a moment of, of friendliness towards his son... Cos I, I think you're right, I think, I think Prince William and the Queen would be against this. But could the king maybe, you know, out of love of his son, might want to forgive him? Or is that... you think that's not right? Uh, I think out of love for his son, he certainly could forgive him. I, mean, I think, you know, that, you know there's, no, there's no theoretical obstacle to a personal reconciliation. There's no theoretical uh, obstacle to personal reconciliation with William, even. Mm. That'll take a long time, of course, we all know that. Um, and if he comes over, he comes on a regular basis to see his family, that, that could certainly happen. If, while he's over here, might he appear on a royal engagement? I guess that could happen. But, you know, undertaking... undertaking engagements and things like that, I don't think that is going to happen, at least not for a very long time. Taking away, obviously, there's a difference between the family institution, which you delve into in your book, Courtiers. But what about the institution itself? So we have a, you know, a very much sort of a new team. I mean, could, could the institution stop Harry coming back or do you think that they could find a way to welcome him? Um, well, they're not going to stop him coming back uh, to have personal relationships, relations with his family. The big issues like this, you talk about the institution, but the big issues like this, uh, although the courtiers, although the advisors are incredibly important, 
and they do have an influence on events. The big decisions are taken by the, the royals themselves, the principals, as they call them. Uh, and that was very evident, for instance, in the original uh, Mexit negotiations, the Sandringham Summit, which we all remember. Um, the advisers drew up a list of alternatives, but it was the Queen and the other members of the family, but particularly the Queen, who took the final decision. And I think that's, the, that's what will happen this time. It'll be the members of the family who take any, any of these big decisions. What about members of the public as well? I mean, I, we've got the family, we've got the institution, but would, are we so far down the line now that the general public would not welcome Harry coming back to carry out a hybrid role or to step in for his father? What do you think the public feel about it? I think we're never too far down the line. I think the public is perfectly capable of... Uh, changing its opinion about people. I think if, if, if Harry showed remorse, if he showed himself uh, dedicated to the royal family, if there was an obvious signs of reconciliation, I think all that could go towards, uh, you know, putting Harry on a different footing in terms of how the public view him. Yeah, things change over time. Things change. The, um, but talking of change, you obviously spent a long time working at the royal family, but you have met Harry and worked with Harry it, was there, a, is there it was, he's generally changed, but what was Harry like when you were on foreign tours with him, like maybe before Meghan? What was he like to report on? Uh, he was fantastic to report on. I mean, one of the things about Harry is he has no filter. Uh, so there was always, you always saw authentic Harry. Which, which was fantastic. Uh, and he was also also unpredictable. I mean, one of my favourite days of royal reporting was in Jamaica in the tour in 2012, I believe, when Harry uh, was at a racetrack with Usain Bolt and sort of basically cheated and, and beat him in the 50-yard dash. Uh, it was a fantastic, uh, I think, unscripted moment. Certainly it took Usain Bolt by surprise. So that was great. But Harry was also always... He was always incredibly authentic. Uh, and he'd take you to places that you wouldn't necessarily we wouldn't normally go on a royal tour. I remember in Brazil, we went to this, this basically drug den, uh, this area called Crackerlandia, which is inhabited by, by drug addicts and dealers and so on. Uh, and Harry wanted to go there to shine a light on what these charities were doing to help these people. And, you know, there was, a, there was a lot of debate behind the scenes when they were drawing up the itinerary for this visit, whether... whether whether they should go there, but Harry wanted to go there. Um, so, you know, he took you places you, didn't, you wouldn't normally go. He, he was amazing in some ways. And the other thing I remember about Harry was I was in uh, Colorado Springs uh, when he first saw uh, this American thing called the Warrior Games for injured, sort of Olympic-style games for injured servicemen. And that, he nicked that idea. Um, and it became the Invictus Games and it went international was, and was Harry's single greatest achievement. But, you know, in that weekend, he, he might have had the idea of buzzing around in his head, the back of his head, but he saw, that, he saw these games, he was incredibly impressed and, and said to his team by the end of the weekend, I'm going to do this. And then he made a speech. So in public, he said, I'm going to do this, we're going to take it to London, we're going to do it next year. And his team were kind of reeling because they thought... What are we going to do within the next 12 months? What are you talking about? Uh, but driven by Harry's energy and vision and enthusiasm, they, they achieved the impossible. So seeing as Harry's raised this idea that you might come back, we've we, we discussed about the 2020 Sandringham Agreement where a hybrid rule, as you'd say, with the Queen completely ruled out. Four years on, you know, Harry's, Harry's brought this subject up so we, we can talk about it, but four years on, do you think that... Is it possible the palace uh, missed the trick and that there could have been a hybrid role or that Harry... or they could find something for him? Because, as you say, he was an asset for the royal family at the time and he could have brought maybe, you know, new perspectives to, like, a, you know, post-Brexit Britain or to the Commonwealth or to, um, you know, during COVID times, he could have helped out. Is yeah. it a missed opportunity? I think, I think your phrase about new perspectives is very interesting because I think both Harry and Meghan... Uh, before they left, before it all went wrong. I felt about both of them, and I, I even wrote this, that they bring a fresh perspective and a fresh approach to the royal family. Uh, the hybrid thing, you know, I think that... I don't think the royal family necessarily missed a trick, but it's possible they could have explored uh, other ways of being a hybrid. In other words, if, if they put constraints 
on what Harry and Meghan did in in their private time, saying, well, you can, if you did this sort of business, we don't think that would impinge too badly on the royal family. So we can see a world in which you spend nine months of the year doing that sort of thing and three months doing royal thing. So did they explore that? I don't know. But, but I think where they missed a trick, the royal family, and particularly the advisors, I think they, they, they're all pretty guilty on this, is they didn't see it coming. They didn't see Harry and Meghan's unhappiness. I mean, Harry's unhappiness had been building up for some time, even before, crucially, even before Meghan showed up. Uh, they didn't see the unhappiness. It was there all, it was there, if you're in on the inside, it was there plain to see about 12 months before Mexit. Um, the famous occasion when Harry and Meghan uh, went to the Albert Hall and she was feeling suicidal. Um, yeah. So the, 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 the signs were there to see, to see. And it wouldn't have changed the outcome. I think Harry and Meghan might still have left, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Because I think being born into the royal family doesn't have to be a life sentence. Uh, but if it had been spotted earlier, it could have been done so much more amicably. Yeah, it's the difference between a, a bitter, painful divorce where the lawyers get involved and it's horrible and an amicable divorce where you remain friends afterwards. Uh, and it could have been done so much better. All the pain and the recrimination and these ghastly salvos from across the Atlantic, all that might have been avoided if they'd spotted the signs earlier and spoken to them. What about Meghan then? So Harry has been back on his own several times with, you know, without Meghan. Could there be a role back? Could there be a role for the Duchess of Sussex or has too much happened? I know you touch very heavily in courtiers about the bullying allegations. Um, as I say, there are new staff now, there, there are long memories. Um, could there be a way if, if Harry did, you know, open up a little avenue there, could, could, could you ever see Meghan coming back and wanting to do any royal duty? I think it's vanishingly unlikely. I mean, she's made it clear what she thinks of the institution. Uh, she's not coming back. She... Her focus is 100% on the United States uh, and, and that platform and what that gives her. Uh, I just can't see it in any way whatsoever. So when she was here, when you were reporting on her before, uh, well, before Meg's here, obviously, um, did she show, do you think that she got stuck in, gave it enough time, showed a lot of interest in wanting to be a working royal? Uh, I think she got stuck in. And what was uh, amazing that um, on the day their uh, engagement was announced, uh, she gave that interview, uh, on t a television interview, and um, she was talking about wanting to take on Commonwealth roles. So basically she, she'd been well briefed and she was perfectly happy to spout her brief on air uh, about, you know, about what this, the future might be for her. Um, and she did some very interesting things. I mean, she, the enthusiasm with which she embraced the, 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 the Grenfell community kitchen and, and suggested them they make a cookbook, which was amazingly, and of course flew off the shelves all around the world. Um, she, she, took, she brought a lot of energy and fresh approach uh, to the whole royal thing. But I also know uh, that you know, for all this, for all the great potential she showed, that if you talk to people on the inside, uh, they believe, rightly or wrongly, but they believe that she was constantly, constantly casting herself a victim, saying, you don't want me, you, you, you think I'm going to fail, you think it's not, you know, I'm not welcome, really. I'm, uh, and it's as if they believe, it's as if she was looking for a way out from the very beginning. From the very beginning. Yeah. Interesting. So what was she like to... Um, you've been on tours with, with Duchess of Sussex as well. Um, was there a change when um, Harry and Meghan started, you know, working and going on engagements together? What, what was she like? What was Harry like when they were together? Well, I, uh, there, there are two things I remember. Uh, one from the Australian tour, uh, which is Australia, New Zealand, Fiji and Tonga. And when we went to Fiji, I believe it was, there was a welcome ceremony, which was, if I'm being honest, and I apologise to anyone from Fiji who's watching, it was quite long and boring. And then about a day or two later, we went to a different part of Fiji, and there was another welcome ceremony, which involved them sitting on two thrones uh, in front of a sort of uh, invited audience. And that was even longer and even more boring. And Harry was 
hacked off with the press. He was annoyed with us for some reason. Uh, there are many reasons why Harry might be annoyed with us. And he spent the entire hour and a bit of this occasion just looking slightly over to one side where we were sitting, we, the print media, and just staring daggers, daggers at us. He was furious. He couldn't hide... Like I said, what I said earlier about this, that Harry has no filter. He couldn't hide his fury. Meghan was sitting bolt up upright in her... Uh, you know, in her throne uh, on, on stage and was kept a perfect Hollywood smile on throughout, uh, perfect posture throughout. She was actually a really brilliant performance and I thought she is a real professional. Uh, and the other thing was that in the South Africa tour, uh, they did an interesting thing that, that every day um, they would give a little kind of sound bite to the TV cameras, so the media would always have something interesting to report about what they had to say about what they were doing that day. Uh, and we, the newspapers, kind of the poor cousins in this arrangement, we won't get anything. We, we, build, we, we could feed off the crumbs from the TV appearance, but you know, we weren't getting our own little chat with Harry or Meghan. We were getting, and then towards the end of the tour, um, it was agreed that Meghan would talk to the newspaper reporters. Uh, and it was agreed, they, they, they insisted it had to be me uh, because they weren't going to have any of the nasty tabloid people who, <laughs> who Meghan, as well as Harry, absolutely hated. So I was pleased to have this little two-minute chat with her. And it was kind of fascinating because it was on the day, so only about four, five, six hours later, they uh, released the statement, the bombshell statement, where they said, uh, that Meghan was suing the Mail on Sunday newspaper about what it published about her. Uh, and also Harry released this statement attacking the press, particularly the tabloid press. Uh, and it made front pages everywhere. Um, and, but you wouldn't have known that talking to Meghan. She was absolutely, you know, smiled nicely, answered my questions. I was allowed two questions. But of course, like all journalists, you always ask a cheeky third question, <laughs> see if you can get away with it. It was quite... It was a deliberately innocuous, cheeky third question because I knew that Harry was in a bad mood that day. There had been a bit of an altercation between him and a television reporter. Mm. So I, I kept it nice. Uh, but she, she answered my third question. Uh, but while talking to her, I just got the impression that she was focusing on a point about 12 inches behind the back of my head. Mm. She was just looking straight through me. And once we'd over and she said, by and walked off. I convinced if I'd bumped into her, she wouldn't have known who I was. I was just, I was just nothing to her. Um, it was a very weird experience. Um, she was totally professional, but no personal engagement whatsoever. That's a real shame. So you concentrate, <laughs> you concentrate on the rules that are here and working. Obviously, I think we think Harry and Meghan, that this idea of them coming back is, is probably a non-starter. Yeah. William, uh, big intervention this week. Um, can, you, can you think of your time as, as, as being a, a royal correspondent? Has he spoken so openly about a controversial topic? I mean, he's touched on Gaza and some of the things he said, um, you know, about... I mean, they're sensible things, I suppose, but about you need to end the war, um, you know, you need to get humanitarian aid. It's quite outspoken. What do you think of his intervention? But also, how does this um, statement come about? Do, he doesn't just sit in a darkened room on his own and draw this up and put it out. There are machinations behind the scenes to actually make sure this statement is, is agreed and accurate, right? What you have to understand about the royal family is that everything they say uh, on, on anything that has any kind of political ramifications is passed by the government. I've, I've, I've spoken to people in, in the royal family who, when, when royals make speeches on, on, on things which you wouldn't think are contentious at all, they still get checked by the government department if, it, if it's crossing that, uh, that area. Um, so, absolutely, that would have been checked by yeah, the Foreign Office, by Number 10, it's, it would have been completely cleared. Um, so, w William, it, it, was, it was definitely outspoken by royal standards, uh, but it was, it was very even-handed. I'll come on to the even-handed bit in a minute. But um, what you have to understand is William... So, William has, has his hands tied in two ways. He has his hands tied by the fact it has to be checked by the government, can't go against government policy. And the other thing is, he wants to be a unifying figure. He doesn't want to be a divisive figure. He doesn't want to pick one side or the other. So, because once the royal family becomes div divisive, there's no point to them. Um, 
so he doesn't want to doesn't want to you know, offend either side and he did he did that he was very careful there's nothing in there you could if you if you really could parse it carefully you could you, you, by talking about the way humanitarian assistance should get in as soon as possible you could interpret that as being critical of israel because uh, the, the the allegation is that they're not letting in humanitarian assistance. Uh, and there was uh, a leading article in The Times um, which said that by saying a ceasefire, uh, it, uh, but not saying only after Hamas is defeated, it's by implication, you know, siding with the Palestinians uh, and Hamas rather than Israel. I would disagree with that because the phrase he uses uh, is... Um, uh, a ceasefire as soon as possible, or words to that effect. And as soon as possible, it's it's very vague that it's open to interpretation. Does as soon as possible mean as soon as possible once Hamas is defeated, or as soon as possible let's just do it now? It's I, I think that was a carefully crafted phrase. So I think I don't think his statement offends anyone. Um, and I don't think it gets into trouble. There were some excitable headlines when it came out about how it might cause a rift with Israel. I think that's just nonsense, utter nonsense. I mean, Israel, they, I think they, they're mildly miffed, but no more than that. Uh, and I read in one, another newspaper, a white wall source, uh, saying that this would add to momentum uh, for the search for peace. I think that is also complete nonsense. Uh, I think William cares about what's going on there. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was very... When he went to uh, the West Bank uh, and Israel uh, a few years ago, he was deeply affected by that, and he was said he, said he was going to keep on paying attention to this issue, and clearly he has. Uh, but I do think Netanyahu's listening, and I don't think anyone else is listening really, and I think we'll all forget about it uh, in a few weeks' time. But William wanted to show he cared. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's the big issue dominating this country's debate. Uh, uh, forget, forget about what's happening in the Middle East. We here are incredibly concerned about it. So I think it's OK for him to talk about it, and I don't think he's made a big mistake. You talk about the cheeky questioning at the end, but... And, and that William maybe not have caused a rift um, with the government or in Israel. The king is someone who we know has been very involved in Middle Eastern affairs. He's obviously unwell at the moment, or we did see him this week come out, um, meet the Prime Minister and, and the Privy Council. But would the king, would we have expected the king to have made that statement rather than William? And would the king be a little bit annoyed that he didn't get the chance to, to, to put that kind of sentiment out, do you think? I mean, I think there's no doubt whatsoever the king is will be extremely concerned about what's going on in Gaza. Uh, when he went to Israel and the West Bank after William, uh, he made a very well... First of all, he went to Israel and he made a very well-received speech there. The, the Israelis thought it was great. Uh, and the next day, uh, when he was on, in the West Bank and he spoke about the plight of the uh, Palestinian refugees, and I can't remember the exact words, I think he said, you are not forgotten. Uh, he, there's, there's, there's no doubt that, we're, that, that Charles, Prince of Wales as he was then, was extremely concerned about what was going on in Gaza then, a few years ago, and will be even more concerned about it now. So I think, yes, the King might have made a statement like this. Okay. Wonderful. Thanks, Val. I've really appreciated having you on. So if you have got this far, then you've clearly enjoyed yourself. So if you want to hear and see more Royal News, then please subscribe below.